All right, uh, welcome. I'm Chief Master Sergeant, uh, I'm Chief Master Sergeant Hellison, Denzel Hellison. Uh, my counterpart, uh, Chief Tool, I'm the 3DO Critical Manager. He's the 3D1 Critical Manager. Uh, as a pair, we manage the entire AFSC. We share the senior and the chief, but we manage the uh, entire AFSC family. So on behalf of the two of us, today I'm going to talk about two things uh, about a significant transition in our 3D workforce over the next couple of years. So those two things are the Agile Airman Model and the Agile Cyber Talent Structure. So normally when we give this brief, it takes 45 minutes or so, so I'm gonna speed through a little bit so we'll have time for questions uh, from all of you as I uh, go through here. Okay, so I'll ask you please to kind of hold your questions until uh, the end. All right, so standard uh, overview. Uh, everything we do is an information domination plan. Uh, uh, goal number three, objective number 3.2, strengthen the cyber workforce. Everything we do falls under that uh, area. So the first thing, and something that everyone needs to understand that you already fundamentally know, we as 3Ds working in cyber IT, we deal with change. Uh, what I did as a technician 10 years ago is not what technicians were doing five years ago, it's not what technicians do now, and we can just foresee that that's what's gonna happen in the future. Technicians are not gonna do today what they're gonna do in five years or even 10 years. So we are always competing against Moore's Law. I think we're all familiar with what, what that is. Right, but the Air Force is helping us with our institutional lane and PME. They give us the change management process. We learn about that, understand what the three steps are. So we understand the change happens. We understand how we need to deal with the change. But fundamentally, if change is going to happen, we need to deal with the fact that change is gonna happen. So what we're gonna talk about from an Agile, uh, Agile Airman model standpoint is how we're going to put change into our uh, training model. model. So I'm just gonna spend a second on this. This is the current construct that everyone should be familiar with. Uh, I'll quote General Bender. What he said is an industrial age solution for an information age problem. Very, very true. Just a split second on that, we'll move, uh, move on. What everyone wants, what every commander, superintendent, supervisor, NCYC, even what every Aaron wants, is they want, to, uh, they want a full up round. They want someone to show up to the unit that you don't have to do a, lot, a whole lot of training you immediately can get them employed and effective on the mission and so forth like that. But we understand the realities, right? We've all been there, we all live it day to day. We recognize the amount of workload we have doesn't allow us always to uh, focus on the training mechanism as much as we possibly could, as much as we should. So we know that there's a training burden at the uh, unit level. But what my job is as a career field manager, what Chief's tool job is as a career field manager is to connect all of the dots for all the training. So from the enterprise standpoint, we talk about people going to Keesler, people to Shepherd, but also connecting the dots with all the other training opportunities we, that we have. So we know that there's training that happens at the squadron level, training that happens at the wing, the MAGCOM. It's my job to connect all of that to ensure that what does arrive at the unit is the most capable and trained individual to do the job. But what it doesn't remove is the supervisors and the chain of command from that unit to continue to do training, OJT, upgrade training, things of that nature. But the goal is to provide you the most uh, capable pull-up round uh, at the unit at, from the get-go. All right, so what we need is a training model that's flexible, modular, timely, and enduring. And by during, I mean, that's a very important aspect of it. It's something that starts whenever they leave BMTS and they first come into our functional lane until they separate, retire, whatever the case would be. So we're talking about 20 to 30 year enduring training timeline. That's the kind of training mechanism that we need. Okay, just a real quick look at uh, the slide as we go through so that you'll better understand. Uh, we have IT fundamentals I'll talk about, 8570, the, the standard 3579 peripheral levels that uh, we utilize for our current construct. Okay, one of the cornerstones for Agile Emma model is modularization of training. Okay, so thinking about, taking, think about all the training we have and breaking it into the component that makes most sense for the individual to learn, understand, and apply. That's what that module represents. So if you look at the way we do training in Keesler and Shepard, it's all about the block. You have a finite date that you enter the block, you have a finite date that you're supposed to leave that block, and you're supposed to assume, uh, consume all of that knowledge from that block. We're gonna change all of that and make that into modules. So we've already done that with the 1X2s. Uh, at the uh, 338, what we did with the 1X2 course with one of the blocks, that's 21 days, we broke that into modules. We also made it self-paced. So an individual might start on day one and they might have all the knowledge they need. They don't need to do the full 21 days. Anyone that needs to go the full 21 days to get that knowledge, either one of those cases is absolutely fine. But there are times when they're gonna be able to get through faster, they're gonna finish that block, and then they're gonna go on to some other module of training. So again, we've already done this. It's self-paced. 
Um, what we also did is a little bit of the 1x3 uh, course, we modularized that. So we have situations where an individual at a unit needs to know a 1x2 job and they need to know a 1x3 job. So by modularizing this, the units are telling Keesler now, I need a 1x2 and 1x3, so I want you to send them through this additional training. They go through their standard 1x2, and then they go and they get the modules of 1x3 so they can be productive when they arrive at their unit. It's been very effective. We're starting our third year on that uh, part now, and that really sort of was the proof of concept for an Agile Hammer model. Now, we, would have, we did call that for a period of time, the 3D 1x2 R shred, which uh, many of you should have heard of. We realized we don't actually need a shred in order to track individuals with that body of knowledge, so we took away the R shred, and we're using by SEIs how we're managing those folks. But back to the uh, self-paced nature of um, the modularized training uh, that we're doing. So we have individuals that instead of 21 days, they're finishing anywhere from five to 10 days early. They're able to get the information that fast as they go through there. There's no need any longer to make them sit there for the 21 days until they leave. But here's the part that uh, I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. There's an evaluation at the end. They have to be able to pass the evaluation before they go. And not what we're used to with just some uh, ORE questions they have to answer. They have to perform that they can actually accomplish what they've learned in those blocks. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. That's modularization. Okay, so back to the, uh, the framework itself. Uh, the first thing that Chief Tool and I did under the Agile Airman Model Construct is we went and we looked at AATC and we changed the AATC. So AATC gave us exactly what we asked for, my predecessor's 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 predecessor. We asked for a very deliberate uh, method for training our individuals. That's exactly what we got. The negative side of that, though, is it takes us 24 to 48, min, uh, 48 months in order to change the content. So the first year, what we did is work with AATC to give them a new construct that's going to allow them to change the content in days and weeks instead of months and years. Right? So the first thing we did is we started looking at ITF. That's the first course that every 3D takes. Uh, it's a 10-day course currently. We're increasing the size of that. We're going to rename it Cyber Fundamentals. What we're doing is we're incrementally putting cyber fundamental knowledge in there from what it currently is. Uh, the first 10 days is a lot of here's Keesler, here's how to be safe, things of that nature. Not that we're removing that, but we're trying to get a different avenue to provide that content. And what we're fusing into it is where we're pivoting to is the workforce. The defensive cyber operations, we call that cyber fundamentals. That's what we're infusing into this ITF that's going to be called cyber fundamentals. Okay. Next, a key part of getting all this to uh, happen is a learning management system or a training management system. Okay, we already have one. Uh, many of you are going to sigh when I say this, but it's Air Force e-learning. So the Air Force e-learning that most of us grew up with, which was 7.4, we uh, are out of that. We updated to uh, 8i uh, about a year, year and a half ago. We do still have some accreditation issues that keeps us from doing all the capability that we have uh, purchased, but what is coming with uh, 8i is uh, what you would expect from modern uh, training environment. So it's multiple platforms. So I work at the Pentagon. So if I'm at uh, my PC at work, I would start training on e-learning right there. I'm gonna stop somewhere, somewhere in the middle. I'm gonna get on the Metro and I'm gonna start heading home and I should be able to use my phone and it syncs me to go exactly where I stopped on my PC. I get off the Metro, metro I get home, I start using my Mac and it syncs with just where I left off with my uh, iPhone. It's that type of capability that we've purchased from the Air Force e-learning but agreed, we don't have it all just yet. So it's multiple platform capable, and it's multiple formats. So I'm gonna talk a little about learning programs to sort of explain that. So learning programs, we are reinventing CDCs, we're reinventing the way that we are providing content to the uh, field. So a learning program, imagine you take a little bit of a book. It could be a sentence in a book, a chapter in a book, uh, just a page in a book, whatever. We can break up a book into the content we actually want an individual to learn. And then we can send them to a YouTube video. We can send them to uh, Air Force developed video. We connect that together with a little bit of a CBT. Not the traditional CBT that we're used to that's serial, where when you start, you have to go to, to the end. All of the CBTs we're putting online in Air Force e-learning now can be broken into just the components we actually use. You don't have to do the entire CBT in order to get what you want. An example of that, the uh, OX2s. Uh, I used to require OX2s do 160 hours of those serial CBTs whenever I only really needed them to learn about 50 hours from the 160. But they were serial CBTs, no choice, had to have them do 160 hours to get 50. Obviously a bad way of doing business because it's an awful lot of waste of time on their, their part, just trying to get that 50 hours worth of content. With this new way of doing CBTs, we just select the part they need. So now in this learning program, if you connect those different types of uh, learning methods, 
to a the skill that you want them to learn. That's the learning program. So that's how we're rolling out all of our content. Our uh, learning program managers are formerly known as the CDC writers. They are the ones that are working with SMEs from each of the MAGCOMs to develop all these learning programs. We've come a long way from zero number of learning programs. Uh, for each of the AFSCs now, we're about 50% done with the number of learning programs we've developed. We're refining those last ones to get to the 100%. Uh, they've draft, they've uh, created draft copies of those learning programs. So you can already go out and see some of those learning programs. You currently have to search for it, but we're going to have it set up so you don't really have to search for it. It's going to be applied to you. When you click on, you look at your dashboard, you already know what the learning programs are that are available for you. So those learning programs are very critical um, for how we're uh, doing our training, or doing our training, and how we get to that multiple uh, formats capable. Now the other part of this learning management system, training management system, is the uh, database searchable. So as a career field manager, I have to create a CAPTP with the part one and the part two with the STS. With this LMS, it's gonna tell me what the STS looks like. So what's gonna happen is airmen are gonna go out to Air Force E-Learning, they're gonna utilize the different learning programs, they're gonna lose, they're gonna utilize portions of uh, CBTs that aren't part of learning programs, and then they're gonna tell me whether those, that content is good or bad, and that's gonna build my STSs. And I'm gonna be able to generate reports as well. I'm gonna be able to go out there and query how is everyone doing on this content? Are they spending time in the content? Are they completing the content? Are they just starting it and not, not completing it? All that kind of thing. It's really powerful for the uh, ability for me. But for you and for commander, what it provides is this. So I'm a commander, I'm a superintendent, and I wanna go out and I wanna find out who has this certain type of training because I have a problem in my unit, right? So I can go out and I can find out who has this individual type of training, and then I can figure out how to get that individual to my unit. Do I use the traditional assignment system to get them to the unit to help solve my problem? Do I bring them in TDY for a period to solve that problem? As a commander and superintendent, you'll figure that out. For an airman, the power that it gives you is you can go in there and you can look at jobs. So there's some job at X unit that you want to get, you'll be able to run a report that's going to tell you what skills you need to do the job at that, that unit. So significantly power, powerful when we get this LMS, TMS online and with all of its uh, capability. Okay, so that takes us to uh, phase two, as learner model. So we have already modularized uh, Keesler, or at least we are, we are working on it right now to get that accomplished. So what I just described a moment ago with those learning programs is the training marketplace. And those are those green blocks that you get um, just before the three, five, seven, and nine level. So those are accessible by everyone all the time. So if you're a nine level and you need a one level type of course, you can get in there and take, take whatever course it is you need. If you're a one level and you need to get in there and, and get a nine level course, it's accessible for you. I don't know the use case for that, but what I'm saying is the possibility is there. There's gonna be no restrictions on what the content is. The restriction is what do you need to know to be most effective in your job today? That's gonna to be the only restriction on the content, okay? All right, and so what we're trying to get to is uh, mission-driven uh, training and assignment-driven assi uh, uh, training-driven assignments. So if you look on your right-hand side, uh, DCWF is a uh, coding. That's what we are going. To, we've already started doing it. If you haven't heard of it, uh, we've already started walking into that. But really, what it boils down to is across DoD, if there is a particular skill and a role within the uh, DoD, everyone calls it X. Everyone calls it Y. Everyone calls it Z. Doesn't matter where your Army, Navy, Air Force, everyone knows exactly what you're talking about when you use that coding associated with the skill and the role that we're talking about. All right, so what that does for us in the Air Force, once we have all of our DCWF coding, our UMDs are gonna tell us exactly what the skills are required for that position. That's gonna be telegraphed back to the training system, back to Keesler, and that's gonna mandate what training you get. So you're gonna take your cyber fundamentals and then you're gonna have a list of modules that you're gonna to need to complete before you go to your first assignment. Chief Tool and I, we want you to know how to do the job you're doing today while preparing you for the job that you're doing tomorrow. We don't want you to go to Keys for 12 weeks, knowing that you're gonna to go to assignment where you're only gonna use one week worth of that 12. That's a waste of 11 weeks of your time and our dollars. That's 11 weeks I'd be using training somebody else and sort of like that. So again, what we're getting to is where you know how to do your job today, where you're going to be assigned, where we're preparing you for the next assignment after that. Assignment driven training. Okay, okay I'm going to skip past phase three and just go straight into phase four, the final phase. All right, so we've talked about the modularization, we've talked about the training marketplace, we've talked a little bit about the evaluation and the vectoring. All right, so again, a cornerstone of the Agile Airman model is evaluation. 
So the evaluations will begin when you're at Keesler. As you're going through those different courses, you're gonna have to pass a stand eval type of uh, evaluation with every module of training that you do. Some of the modules actually be incorporated into a larger type of stand eval, but the way we have it set up right now, we're already doing it with the 1X2, so imagine you go into a room like this, there are, four there are five different desks, each of those desks re represents an Air Force base. You as a 1X2 and a 1X2, uh, or a 1X3, have to go into that environment and have to set up five functioning network bases that can pass traffic back and forth. What we're trying to do right now is put the uh, system side into it, so your OX2 will be going in there. Once the network is stood up, they would set up the uh, server client architecture so that we know that not only is the network working, but we know that we're passing uh, good data for users and somewhere like that. That's the type of evaluation that individuals are going to have to pass in order to get out of um, or get into our AFSC family. All right, so if we're doing that level of evaluation at Keesler, then I can start to vector you. I can start to say, well, you know what? Your skill is X, and here's where I need your skill. So it makes most appropriate, it's most appropriate for me to send you to this unit. It's most appropriate for you to actually have this AFSC. So you could have an individual that goes through this process, and maybe they went through the networking, but it turns out that their aptitude ability is actually for systems. So instead of forcing them to go into networking, I'm gonna utilize their skill and their aptitude for systems and vice versa. That's the nature of this evaluation of vectoring with the Agile Ember model. Okay, and that is it for the Agile Ember model. Okay, so the uh, AFSC portion of this is the Agile Cyber Talent Structure. Okay, again, overview. Okay, and then why are we doing this? Okay, we're doing this to increase our lethality, right? We know that there are threats out there from our peer adversaries and sort of like that. We have to have a more capable workforce and increase our lethality. So that is one reason we're doing it. We need a more focused workforce. So right now on the active duty side, what do we do? We take an individual, we teach them how to do something, we get them to be very effective at the unit that they're at, we pluck them, we move them somewhere else, and probably that job we send them to has nothing to do with the job we just taught them how to do, right? A bad way of doing business. So we need to make sure that if that individual has learned that level of skill in that particular functional area of our community, we probably should take that focused area and move them to another job where the uh, focused area is similar to what they already know. And the last thing is professional growth opportunities. So we know, for instance, that the, the uh, active duty retirement system has changed, and in about three years, we're gonna find out those individuals that really wanna stay in the Air Force and those that were in long enough to get their retirement benefits and then move along, right? So we have to start having an environment where an individual wants to be here. You're volunteers, we're all volunteers, but we want you to be here. So we need to make sure the jobs are lined up in such a way that you want to have a challenging boarding job, you want to do the job that we've uh, provided for you, and that uh, you're gonna uh, learn the skills that you need to do that. So with that, you also have the challenges. So I've already talked about uh, Moore's Law. When I was talking about Agile Learning Model, we know the change is coming. So we need to be developing an AFSC structure that takes into account that change is gonna happen. And then lastly, the inflexibility of the AFSCs. So as a superintendent, I had a body of individuals. Let's say I had 100 individuals to accomplish the mission. Okay, so that's great that I have 100, 100 individuals to accomplish the mission, but I have different jobs that I have to actually accomplish. What the AFSC structure did is it would prevent me from utilizing, for instance, an OX3 whenever I had a high demand for OX2 job to be accomplished. Right? It's that kind of inflexibility that our AFSC structure uh, provides to us. Uh, so like that, and then so the other part that's happened is about every 10 years, we redo our AFSC structure because we find out it's not working for us. We do a whole lot of work, we change the AFSC structure and move on. We wanna get away from that redoing this every 10 years. So these are the whys. All right, so this is the comprehensive solution. Okay, we talked about the Agile Learning Model. So what we're talking about is an adaptable training model, something that's gonna help us adapt to the changing environment and adapt to it quickly. So now we're gonna talk about the uh, ACTS, the Agile Cyber Talent Structure, how that's an adaptable AFSC structure, and again, it's gonna help us to adapt to uh, things as the world changes. The third leg on this is the talent, the talent management. So uh, we, as a 3D workforce, we walked away from the tool that the Air Force had provided to us, and that's SEIs. We had moved away from using those SEIs, it's hard to find them on UMDs, it's hard to find them on individuals, there's a few pockets of excellence out there, but for the most part, we walked away from them. Well, that's the way that AFPC actually does talent management as it exists today. So we've been working with superintendents and MatchCom functional managers over the last year to reinvigorate the system with SEIs so we can have the system do what we want it to do. Because right now, let's take a mission defense team individual. Let's move them from, let's say, uh, Ramstein to CONUS. 
right now, in order to make sure that individual that knows how to do MDT, to get them to an MDT CONUS, it takes six people to get involved at different levels just to move one individual, right? So you can imagine a workforce of 28,000 people, almost 20,000 active duty, there's no way that we can do that kind of uh, talent management um, without some sort of system help. So we're gonna start using SEIs, but what this really represents is where we're moving to, and that's the talent marketplace. So the 17s started doing talent marketplace last year. All of the officer AFSCs started doing talent marketplace this year. And the way that works is the officer has input to TMP, the unit has input to TMP, it gonculates, and then it spits out, spits out a report for the uh, DTs, for the officers to use as they're moving folks around to the different uh, positions, sort of like that. On the enlisted side, our assignment system is far more complex than that. Than that. Absolutely, we want to get unit requirements and we want to get individual requirements and try to gonculate that together. But the assignment rules that we deal with are very complex and something that simple would put us right back to the manual process of doing talent management. So what we're expecting to get from TMP is a tool that's going to help to automate that talent management. So the one Charlie starting October 1st are the official enlisted AFSC to go through and start looking at TMP and figure out not only how to do it from an enlisted perspective, but what are all the assignment rules and perhaps cultural rules that we need to change in order to make TMP an automated system to work for us. So that third leg is critical to these other two that we're putting in here. That is the only way we're going to have short-term gains, gains as well as long-term success. And what we're really trying to get to with, all of the, with these three is the right airmen, the right training, right time, right mission. That's where we're trying to get with all this. Okay, so we're moving to a capability-based AFSC construct. So as you see here, OCO, DCORA, DCOIDM, and DOTA. So OCO and DCORA, those are the trigger puller portions of the uh, capability. That absolutely is one Bravo for um, job jar. The uh, one Delta sevens, we have a little bit of DCORA simply because we're on CMF. It doesn't necessarily mean that we do the RA, it just means that we're there to support the one Bravo fours as they execute the RA mission. In future briefings, I'll probably gonna slide that over so you see the line break between DCORA and DCOIDM. Okay, where the one Delta seven job jar is, is DCOIDM. Secure and protect is our job jar. So what we say is we have a skill set approaching that of a one Bravo four, but it's for a different purpose. It's for secure and protect as opposed to some of the uh, one Bravo four job jar uh, tasks they have. And then we have a foot we leave in Doden, and then we have the 3D rolls that continue in Doden. Okay. Oops. So phase one. So phase one really is getting at the DCO. Again, we as a workforce are pivoting to defensive cyber operations, and this first phase is to help us get there. So uh, if you look there at the 3D, it's that standard thing that you would expect to see. You have a one level on the left-hand side, and then all the way over on the right-hand side, you have the chief CE encode, 3D 100. Okay, but you'll see there in the middle, at the area where we actually need uh, DCO capability at this moment is at that technician level. So you see for a short period of time, we have those two, the five and the seven skill level for the one delta seven. We also see the flexible career field path low, and that's those dash lines that go back and forth. So you can see that an individual could be a staff sergeant and they go over to one delta seven, they do one delta seven work, and they come back to the 3D workforce, and vice versa. You can see where an individual was a one delta, uh, goes over to one delta seven the entire time, but then whenever they get up to uh, senior, they come back over to the 3D, okay? The last thing I want to point out here is the 3D AFSCs. So some of the 3D roles, I don't say AFSCs, but the 3D roles, some of them are going to be with us for a long time. We have no idea how long. I don't have a crystal ball. Chief Tool doesn't have a crystal ball. But we are going to be developing both of these career fields until those 3D roles um, become uh, expired, I guess. OK, so that's phase one. So phase two, we're standing up the actual career path. So again, similar to the 3D career field path, you have the one delta seven one skill level all the way to the CM code on the right hand side. But again, you still see those flexible career field path flow going back and forth between the two. Okay, sort of the mirror opposite of phase one and phase three. Again, we know we have 3D roles that we need to fulfill and they're gonna be at the technician level. So we have the five and the seven level and the 3Ds that still exist. And the final phase where we actually have the AFSC agility that we're trying to get to. So every uh, airman has been assessed into the Air Force as a one delta seven. We 
calls this the slick. They're going to be a slick at the one level and the three skill level, but we're going to have that evaluation that's going to occur before they get their five level, and that's going to tell us what the appropriate shred is that they're going to go to. Are there talents in networking? Are there talents in systems? That's how we're going to get to that point. And then, of course, on to the uh, seven skill level, back to the single uh, senior master sergeant, chief master sergeant. Okay, so I've kind of explained to you what the slick is, and that's part of what we have, I call it self-healing nature of this AFSC structure. But I'm going to drop down here where it says cyber example down there at the bottom. So the nuclear community is frequently coming to Chief Tool and I saying, we need a separate 3D AFSC just for nuclear. As if cyber is different in nuclear than it is anywhere else. As if a Cisco router isn't the same in nuclear as it is in any other enterprise, right? So we, we're always resistant to that, but sake of argument, let's say that we actually do create a 3D career field that's for nuclear, or in this case, we create a one delta seven shred for nuclear. What we'd find out over the course of time is there's no difference in that one delta shred from any other one of, of our shreds, right? So we would end up doing away with that shred, realizing that it didn't need to exist in the first place. So what, what is different about uh, the 3D structure and this one delta seven structure is all I do is reevaluate them and I put them in the appropriate shed, shred for their skill set. So again, that's the agility and the flexibility this AFSC structure gets us to. So what we're looking at is a solution that's not going to last us the next 10 years. We're looking at a solution that's going to last us the next 25 or 30 years. So I can create sheds, shreds as I need to, I can get shreds, uh, get rid of shreds as I need to according to whatever the environment is. And then how are we doing the talent management? As I told you, we're doing it through SEIs. So you'll see a one delta seven A shred or a brief B shred, and they'll have appropriate SEIs attached to them and to the UMD. So we know what their true skill set is, and that's how we're managing the talent around the workforce. Okay. I believe that is the last standard summary slide, and then questions. All right, not bad. I did that in about 30 minutes, and now the floor is open for questions from you all. For your example, will that include the nine S's? Uh, they're not currently part of our uh, career field, so no, they're not included in that yeah. Chief, uh, what, what kind of programs do we have in place or maybe plans to retain these people at the technician level? Because with the recent changes to laws, we're promoting people faster than ever. Right? You identify your top performers, that person gets a must promote, promote now, they're getting mastered in time. Right? So you're getting way less time out of them at that like staff sergeant, tech sergeant level. What are we doing to try to reward those people at that level so they either, hey, I'm gonna stay in, or you know, maybe I'm gonna stay at this level of time because when they hit master, you know, they're going to manage. So which body of individuals are you trying to train, retain the uh, technicians or the master sergeants? Yes, at the technician level. Right. Okay, because, so because those people are gonna jump ship because they're, they're gonna go to private industry to get more money. So there's no financial incentive for them to stay. Yeah, the goal is always to align the Air Force needs with the members' needs, and that doesn't always align. We know that people are going to assess out. We understand that we are a provider for that industry and sort of like that. But it boils down to what I had said before. I, I can't promise more dollars and sort of like that. Uh, when we compete for bonuses, uh, we don't compete well for bonuses because from a corporate structure standpoint, our numbers are not great, but they're not as bad as others. So others get the bonuses where we don't. And I can't, you know, just, I just don't have those mechanisms in order to retain the workforce if it's going to be a monetary question. But what I can do is I can try to change, I can reorganize so that we have jobs that are challenging or boring, the jobs that people want to have in order to get them in. That's the mechanism that I have to do that. You said you're going to be using SEIs more. Are we going to see more special duty pay tied to those SEIs? Yeah, so SDAP is a little bit easier um, to get um, compared to bonuses, but it's a matter of making the case to the corporate structure to do it. So yeah, absolutely. We've already started talking about that and it's the different pillars of uh, excellence that we already have in our 3D community. Okay. All right, next question. We got two for you, Chief. Uh, first on your email process for your pipeline students, yep. are you taking in, into account equipment at basis? So, you know, one X2s, whether I've got a, a set of Juniper switches at one base or Cisco at the other, day because you always run into that where if anyone's coming to upgrade Juniper, I've got Cisco, my troops are Cisco, what do I do? Right. So uh, what we're doing is we're moving back to fundamentals. Um, if I can teach you how to do something on Windows NT as a server side, I'm going to use that. If I can teach you how to do uh, Cisco routing and I use a Avaya, I'm going to do that. Um, that's simply the route of reality we live in. Um, I'm not going to be able at Keesler to be able to give the level of training that you need for that specialized skill. But if I get you to understand the foundational knowledge and more importantly, what we're really infusing into all of our new courses is 
your troubleshooting and problem solving ability. That's far more important than understanding the technical skill of a given Cisco router or a given uh, Windows server and things of that nature. So that is paramount as far as when we do our evaluations that you have gained that uh, problem solving and troubleshooting capability. So uh, in that, um, we recognize that you're getting the fundamentals, so how are we going to get that technical skill for the specific uh, devices that you uh, are going to be working on? That's where we're working with the managed comms currently, trying to figure out how we can do that. Uh, whether it's an FTU-like solution, if it's something we can do through uh, uh, CBT and VLAB or simulator, um, different kind of avenues like that is how we're trying to get at that, that part for specific technology. Okay. okay. Second question I had was, yeah. how are you rolling the, your seven level technicians into what used to be a plan for building you don't have anymore, so I'm stealing from former plan shop from what's available, right? Right, so uh, plans for us is not a specific AFSC or anything like that. It's really, we all should understand how to plan, but it's also about specialization. What individuals do you need to know more about planning than others and put them in the right place? So it goes back to everything that we're trying to accomplish here. There's some folks in the community that we are gonna specialize uh, in different focus areas of our, of our job job. And planning probably is gonna be one of them. But generally speaking, we're gonna teach basic planning to everyone and then hopefully from there we can figure out those locations where we need true planners and train the individual to be a true planner at those locations and move them around appropriately. Good? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, bye. Chief Sergeant Basham, uh, FD Warren Air Force Base. I got a couple questions. First, um, you know, normally a comms squadron kind of falls under MSG since we're that, that support, that three um, prefix. So now that we're going to move one to more operations, how does that change? Do we stay with MSG? Do we go to a, an OG? What does that look like? I don't know. Don't know. So I, lots of conversations from many years have been going on about all of that. But what it boils down to is that we as a 3D workforce are doing more and more operations. So regardless of where we actually reside, it only makes sense for us to move to operational AFSC, regardless of where we end up executing the mission from. And then the corporate structure will make their decisions and then we'll, we'll do accordingly. Right? Uh, second question was um, the, the talent management or the training management system you have. Ever thought about uh, bringing in, you know, DISA offers training. Mm -hmm. There's free training I just learned about with Tanium. Is there any way that we can get that rolled into that? So, hey, I need somebody to work my BMC that can do uh, a red. Can we get them on that training path to go there first and, and TDYs that sort of training? Yeah, so that's exactly the intent of the LMS TMS. So it doesn't matter whether the training is coming from industry, from joint. Uh, we have one unit where the individuals go to a community college. They don't even do OJT necessarily at the unit. They immediately go to a local university, a local community college, where they get all their training and education, and they come back and start to apply it. All of that kind of information we want to be in one source. Instead of the plethora of locations that we have to stumble across training, all the information be in one place. And so those learning programs or learning program managers, it's their job to figure out what all those training opportunities are, get it into either a learning program or get it into LMS so that all of you can, hopefully instead of stumbling across it across, uh, out, out on the web, you're gonna stumble across it in LMS and then you're gonna know where to go. In case of that um, local community college, what you'd expect to see is, it's gonna tell you the community college, where it's located, what their content is for, who you're gonna have to pay in order to do it, all that other sort of stuff, so kind of their information. So just multiply that by all the different opportunities that Possibly have. One location is the goal. Okay. Go ahead, sir. With the uh, one challenge that we've always seen at schoolhouses is keeping the information current, mm -hmm. um, especially in the cyber career field where it's constantly yeah. changing and we're constantly rolling out new tools like ARED or you know, Avaya or whatever. whatever. Um, so, what, uh, along with this, making it modular, um, what, what's the process of keeping it very current as well? Yeah, so uh, the actual ATC structure is we only go back and look at our Kiesler stuff per AFSC every 24 months. Chief Tool and I are doing it every 12 months. And to be honest, we're activating and engaging with it a whole lot more frequently than that to make decisions. So the first part is simply changing the way that we engage with the ATC and how we want content to be presented, which we're already doing. The other part, and so we're trying to change the ATC rules, the other part is, in reality, there's no way I'm actually going to be able to keep up cutting edge immediately at Kiesler. Even if I can get, if I can get um, content down to changing in days and months, I'm just not gonna be able to get it and bring it in that fast. So what we're looking at, looking for is at the squadron mm -hmm. wing and uh, MAGCOM level, they're probably gonna be the first ones to see that we need some type of new training. They're gonna help us develop that modularized training and then it's gonna be a whole lot fast, uh, a whole lot quicker for us to get into Kiesler where appropriate. Um, we're still gonna have the same construct though. You still have the stuff at Kiesler, you 
have stuff that's potentially going to be MagCom, Wing, and Squadron, but where appropriate, we're going to quickly get it back into the Keystone pipeline so that folks can get it under that way. Much faster process than before. Make sense? Yep. Okay. All right. Next question. Sergeant Hills from uh, Joint Communications Support Element. And I just had a question uh, as we look to the one Delta is getting those identified in there. Uh, some of us that are in the joint environment, we go through like Chase at Sea or Soul Rock or South Coast DC, uh, where we uh, cover a plethora of everything from SATCOM to desktop. Will any of that be maybe considered as those identified as we go forward? Yeah, a absolutely. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether we'll make it into an SEI or not. We have a MAGCOM functional manager for there, and he should be bringing that kind of information to us, as well as if it comes up through any of our loading program managers, and then we'll make a decision about whether an SEI should be created. But to go back to the TMP a little bit, it has the, they call SEI's attributes in TMP, and they have the ability to track over 50,000 attributes. So imagine the level of flexibility that we're going to be able to have to understand what your actual skill set is, what the skill set is at the UMD level, and get the two of those to match. The example I frequently use is lithic Linux. So if you really know how to do Linux, right, we're probably going to have an attribute of Linux 1, 2, and 3. And if you have the skills of Linux 3, then I start matching you up to the location where you need Linux 3 attribute capability. Right. All right. There's a finite number of SCIs we can actually create before the system breaks. Yeah, I'm sorry, Chris, this is out of Fort Worth. Uh, with all of these changes, how is the enterprise as a service, the contracting everything out to affect it? Kind of training, maintaining training and recruits. So, not specifically ITAS, but the reason that Chief Tool and I started down this road of doing all this, well, th this isn't new. This started in 2014 and 2015 with uh, our predecessors uh, getting with Rand, Gardner, and doing studies and finding out what exactly is it that we need to solve this problem once and for all and sort of like that. Then it started with, uh, or then it moved on to chief working groups in 2015 and 2016. And then Chief Tool and I got in the spot and we started to move everything forward. The idea is we know the change is happening, so we need this type of structure in order to get to whatever that change is. To me, it doesn't really matter whether ITAS does or doesn't happen. I'm going to be able, I'm going to know what the requirements are for the workforce that I need to train, but this construct between the Agile Airman model, the Agile Cyber Talent structure, and the TMP is going to allow me to satisfy whatever that requirement is that comes down the road. The thing I frequently talk about is uh, there's a Chinese user university that says that they figured out how to do quantum computing. I, I don't know if I believe that they have, but if they actually have, that is going to change our, that's going to change our world the way that cyber and IT work, if that's actually true. And there's some other things that aren't quite as bad, but they're still significant. Artificial intelligence, human augmentation, our movement into the cloud, things that we knew were gonna be coming at some point. The point of this structure is to allow us to pivot quickly, not 24 to 48 months, but quickly within six months to these different changes so that we can make sure the individual technician is capable to be, is able to be as capable as possible with the mission set that they're getting. All right, next question. Chief Service Member for Purple Field. Um, as an RF transmissions person, when we look at the shred outs, we don't really see where we kind of fit into the new structure. Um, what are you guys doing in terms of figuring out where RF fits either as transport or uh, and got increasing demands with uh, the network ability of, and, and IT constructs and what we do? Yeah, so first of all, you are absolutely part of the One Delta 7. Um, Workforce, uh, I know I see a whole lot of that. Uh, we, we don't really uh, utilize Reddit or Facebook because we recognize you all hate us, we're stupid, we don't know how to do anything well, we get it, right? But um, we do have the mill suite. Uh, actually, let me go here to the last slide, communication stuff, right? We'll talk about this here in a second. Uh, you are part of the workforce, and it's gonna be that evaluation. Where does your aptitude lie? Is it on the, the uh, what you might call the net network side, or is it on the system side? So we're gonna evaluate you, we're gonna give you one of those two shreds, and we're gonna use SCIs to make sure we manage your talent to the right place. And we get TMP in place, and we're gonna make sure we talent all of your, or we're gonna make sure we talent manage all of your attributes to the right place. Uh, well, the goal here is to get to, and again, from an activity standpoint, instead of plucking you up and just putting at you the first next assignment that uh, comes available, what we wanna get to is you should have 60% of the knowledge before you go to that next job, right? With these attributes, I'll know that, and I'll know what jobs to connect you to. I don't know what
what jobs you're going to be capable of doing. So absolutely part of the uh, one Delta 7 job jar, you're absolutely going to be talent managed just like everyone else. Don't be afraid that your job's going away just because you're not going to have a 3D AFSC any longer. Make sure you tell all of your friends. All right, so back to this. So what we do communicate through is middle suite. So we uh, initially had the middle suite for a cyber airman, we have one for seniors, we have one for chiefs, and then we stood up one for agile airman model and agile cyber talent structure. On each of those agile airman model and agile cyber talent structure, you'll find not only the briefing, the video, uh, all that, you'll also find FAQs. So you can imagine the number of questions I receive in venues like this, I receive on email, we receive on the middle suite. We probably get 100 or more questions for each of the FAQs that we have. For each on each of those sites. So what we do is we kind of boil down those hundred or more questions into one representative question. We create the FAQ. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen it already and you have questions, go out and take a look at the briefing and the slides and then take a look at the FAQs and it's going to answer probably a whole lot of your questions. If you still have questions after that, the reason we have this uh, presence right here is we do want to hear from you. I absolutely can make decisions about you all day long. Chief Tool can make decisions about you all day long. And you're not always going to like our decision, right? But if you provide me input, I'm going to make a better decision. This is your avenue. What we're asking for is professional proactiveness, right? So if you see a problem, chances are you know the solution. So when you start posting stuff here, by all means, post problems, as long as it's not classified, it's just not a classified environment. Post the problem, but also post your potential solution. You may not have the silver bullet solution, but you give us a starting point for where we need to head and where we need to do our research. Chief Tool and I are adamant about changing everything we possibly can in the short time that we're gonna be in charge before we move on and the next cycle of uh, curriculum managers comes and takes over. But we need your input to do it. So we ask you, um, if you want to engage with us, here's where you engage with us. If you want to vent, go to Reddit and go to Facebook. All right? Okay, next question. Can you uh, get some rumors on the, uh, the three DOs, um, knowledge managers? Yeah. What, what's going to happen with them? Can you just clear the air on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in 2009, when we changed from the two E's and the three C's, we created the uh, 3DOX1 knowledge manager. And at that time, we tasked them to operationalize KM. What we didn't do was two things. One, we didn't change the schoolhouse, the training, anything of that nature. So we told them we wanted to operationalize KM, but never gave them the tools to actually do it. And then we never actually strategically communicated and made sure that commanders and superintendents understood the capability that OX1s were supposed to be providing. So that's where I'm going back and re-attacking that. The joint community, 10 years ago, a little over 10 year, years ago, they started to operationalize KM. They're very good at it now. So what I've actually been doing over the last couple of years is borrowing from their schoolhouses to teach some of our OX1s how you're supposed to operationalize KM, and then I'm doing it at locations where they can now take that operationalized knowledge and they can prove that it works at that given location. But think of OX1s and OX4s for that matter as our problem solvers, right? So what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to take a process problem to our OX1s or OX4s, and they're supposed to look at our processes and develop a solution in the form of a tool for us. So the OX1s have SharePoint, that's the tool we've given to use, where the programmers have all the different programming languages that we have. But in the end, it's the same kind of concept. They're there to solve problems as far as our uh, units go. So that is operationalizing KM. And whenever people say that OX1s aren't cyber, they are absolutely part of cyber. Just to follow on, the, yeah. the programs that they're specifically concerned about are the bylaw programs yeah. that they manage, which is the FOIA, the Privacy Act, and the records, yeah. um, and doing the uh, answers to those. So I'm getting feedback from them that they're hearing that they're moving, that those jobs are moving to potentially another AFSC. And I'm, trying, I'm not really? getting that from you guys, so wow. I, I don't know what's going on there. So. Uh, admittedly, that, that conversation has been going on for a lot of years. Uh, about, as far as I'm aware, records managed, all the bylaw programs are not moving out of our job job. Our OX1s are still going to be responsible for it. But uh, culturally, everyone thinks that's the only thing that they do. It is the tiniest part of their actual job. And that's really a good example of the problem solving. So the situation we're in right now is squadron commanders should be going to our KMCs. They should be going to our OX1s and saying, okay, I've been tasked to uh, uh, manage all of these records that I have. What am I going to do about it? And they should be using SharePoint to help develop a tool for that commander so they can solve their problem. That's kind of the end of their job. They have solved the problem for that commander. Now the problem, now the, the uh, records management program is owned by that commander and how they're going to execute it, right? So then they should be able to walk away and start solving the problem for the next comm squadron or the next uh, squadron commander. 
that's the nature of that. So we're not getting away from any of the bylaws, but our level of engagement in it is far less than it has been in the past. All right. All right, fair enough. All right, go ahead. Uh, with the developer comes second DevOps, are you gonna be plugging up your numbers for the three DLR pools? Yeah, so we're gonna be doing uh, what do you mean by sec DevOps? It seems like that's the new buzzword. Yeah, okay, right? Whether it's DevOps, sec DevOps, right, right. And, and people utilize that, not actually what the, uh, me the word means, but they, they mean it in a way. If you mean from an agile software uh, development standpoint, uh, absolutely. So we have uh, individuals that have gone to Castle Run as well as other AFSCs that have gone to Castle Run. And right now, there is about 18 folks that are arriving at Kessel Run to do the Agile software development. Meanwhile, we're standing out training centers. Uh, you can think about it as a FTU-like type of organization. So what we're doing is we're picking different uh, computer programming organizations throughout the enterprise, and we're having them robust up their training mechanism so that they can now have other programmers from other units attend for a period of time to understand how to do Agile software development. So uh, those five units, they're getting very close to having full up programs so that we can have commanders send programmers to those units, teach them how to do that stuff, and they come back to the unit with just goodness and uh, helping them to solve problems. That's how we're approaching that. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, maybe we can talk out. All right, uh, another question. All right, I got three minutes. Uh, this may just be unique to our, our cyber weapon system. I'm on the CSCS and I'm out of Ramstein. Um, our FTU is not embedded at Keesler, and maybe others are as well. So our airmen have to leave Keesler and come to Ramstein until they can get a GTC so they can fly back to the States to go to the FTU. And it uh, you know, causes lots of problems. Um, is there any work to get the FTUs embedded, uh, kind of like you showed in the slides, uh, you know, rolling from you know, from train into IQT, MQT? all in place. Yeah, that is how the uh, corporate structure pays, organizes, and server like that. We've been working on it for a long time to get them to uh, resolve that. Uh, with, to be honest, a little success so far. Uh, but um, they are listening, and they're looking at how they can actually change that. It really has to do with the color of money, how things get paid for, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, but we have been working with uh, superintendents to give them a workaround so how they can uh, take care of that. And I can talk to you about that um, offline. So there's the hope that we're going to be able to come up with solution that allows us to do that kind of thing, but until ADC sort of changes some of their rules, we're kind of stuck with the way that it works right now. So unfortunately, not a happy answer for that question. And there was one more question. I think that's uh, the last one. Yeah, yes. Slightly more specific one. Uh, in past iterations of the CSI, we've seen uh, the backshop of Vico, AD, iDemo, or it's being called, mm -hmm. uh, was going over to LRS. Is that still happening? We haven't heard much about that. So uh, currently, it's in the risk reduction phase. And it changes, it seems like, almost daily and sort of like that. So I wouldn't want to talk about anything today that uh, what it is, because tomorrow it's going to change. So when they've completed the risk reduction portion of it, then we'll have a better idea of what exactly ITES is going to be able to do for us, really what the impacts are going to be on the workforce, what type of new training or a, a different kind of training I need to develop in order to make sure that we have technicians that are capable of doing the job and sort of like that. And with that, uh, I am out of time. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I will stay up here for those that either didn't want to ask a question openly or those that still have questions after we've uh, finished the Q&A. Thank you.